So as you heard, we only recently invited Darren here uh, because we didn't want him to visit for a long time. Uh, uh, Aaron is a, a professor in UPenn. Before that, he has been in uh, CMU doing his PhD work there and spent a year in Microsoft Research. Um, Aaron is doing a lot of work in the realm of privacy. Actually, he's one of the persons who is uh, constantly pushing forward the envelope right, and uh, producing a lot of interesting work. I'll just mention uh, a few of his works, like uh, he presented with uh, Peter Gosh, uh, a framework of, uh, that opened a lot of research on selling privacy in an auction. Okay. So luckily I didn't say anything smart by now. And, uh, and uh, he's been responsible to, for a lot of the work who um, established and strengthened relationships between uh, questions of privacy and game theory. And he also contributed to uh, uh, solving some of the algorithmic, algorithmic uh, problems in privacy. Uh, maybe we'll his first and uh, the work that we uh, happened to uh, know him by uh, early on is his work on um, uh, uh, producing uh, wood differential privacy, producing data uh, that can be released about individuals. Uh, this problem of private data release was, and, and the results that Aaron with the collaborators presented was very surprising to us at the time. I think it's still uh, one of the central questions that we're looking at them in, in differential privacy. Um, Aaron, um, maybe I shouldn't go over that. Uh, yeah, and so, Today, uh, Aaron already spoke to us about some uh, new results in the morning, and uh, now he'll speak about prices and markets, and I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kobe. Get wired up. Yeah, so thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, to avoid talking about anything of too high quality, I'm going to make sure I don't discuss privacy at all. Um, this is joint work with a bunch of uh, excellent collaborators of mine at Penn. Um, and uh, as I talk, like, definitely like, stop me and ask questions. This will make the uh, process a lot more fun. And also, I have this sandwich to eat. So if you guys are <laughs> asking questions, I can take a bite here and there. Um, OK, so, so I want to oh, maybe just to like, get a sense of the room. like. How many people here think of themselves as primarily computer scientists Everyone. and economists? OK, great. So <laughs> you guys can heckle me. So, so I want to start by sort of marveling at a, at a fact that you know, we all uh, probably ag agree on, and, and economists might feel they've totally explained, which are that prices are really remarkable objects. OK, like I can go into a market, and, and markets are these really sort of remarkable decentralized things. Um, I look around, I observe prices, everybody else in the market does the same thing. And without coordinating with one another, we decide like what we want to buy, just sort of based on our own, you know, like greedy self-interest. I look and, you know, see what prices are of things and, and buy the stuff that I want, and, and everyone else does the same thing, right? So everyone's in a decentralized way optimizing their own utility functions, and Nevertheless, things, you know, at least at a high level, seem to work out, meaning market's kind of clear. There's not substantial shortages or, or um, surpluses. And generally, the resulting allocation is pretty good. Okay, and then there are some bumps in the road, you know, the 2008 market crash notwithstanding, markets do a, a pretty good job. Okay, so, so, this, so prices are really cool. They seem to coordinate these markets. So uh, what I want to do first, just because uh, you know, not everyone here is, is an economist, is I just want to um, give a, an overview of what the theory, the classical theory tells us. Okay, and I'm going to spend a little bit longer on this than I would for an economics audience. But 
the classical theory is pretty cool, so you know, it's like more fun than, than the stuff I'm going to eventually tell you, which, which is new. So you know, uh, I, I thought I'd put more time into this. So let me just sort of recap what the, the theory tells us about the extent to which prices coordinate markets. So first of all, I, I just want to lay out some notation. I want to talk about a commodity market. And I'm going to think about it as a, a set of k types of discrete goods. Okay, So these are things that are you know, indivisible, k different types of them. And each of them is going to have some supply. Okay, And I'll think of the supply as you know, bigger than one, but like ideally, you know, like much bigger than one. I'm not, I'm not selling, you know, like, you know, irreplaceable uh, pieces of art that are unique. I'm selling bananas. And I've also got a set of buyers, okay, n buyers. And each buyer is going to have a valuation function that tells us as a function of the bundle of goods, the subset of types of goods he might get, how happy he is with that set of goods. And let me just normalize things so that values are numbers between 0 and 1. Okay? And an allocation, a feasible allocation, is just some mapping that says who gets what. Okay, it's a mapping um, from the buyers to bundles of goods that satisfies feasibility constraints. So it makes sure that um, this mapping doesn't assign more copies of any good than there are. Okay? And uh, although the results I'm going to talk about hold in some generality, and I'll tell you what the generality, what, what that generality is, just to make things sort of simpler for various parts of this talk, I'm going to restrict attention to the case in which buyers just want one good, which is going to simplify some of the notation, some of the arguments. Okay, but uh, things will apply more generally, I'll tell you um, about it. Okay, so in this special restricted case, evaluation function is just a mapping from goods to values. And um, similarly, uh, an allocation is just a, a matching, a matching between um, buyers and goods. Okay, does that make sense notationally? Okay, so, so what are people going to do? What are people going to do when they face prices? We're going to assume that people are um, rational and self-interested, but we don't want to assume too much else. Okay, so when facing prices, people are going to buy the things that they want the most given those prices. Okay, so, so in particular what that means is I'm going to define the demand set of a buyer given some prices to be the set of bundles of goods that maximize their utility for getting those goods, where, where that's just the value for the bundle, the value they have for that bundle, minus the sum of the prices they'd need to pay to get those goods. Okay? So, um, you know, I say this is a set because there might be, you know, you, you're, you might not have a uniquely favorite bundle of goods given the prices. Okay? So this, there might be ties. And I'm not going to assume what you're going to buy in your demand set. I'm not going to assume how you break ties, but I am going to assume that buyers will choose something in their demand set. Okay, so buyers aren't going to take a suboptimal choice when they can do better. Okay, so, so, so there's this object in, in sort of you know, classical economic theory called a Walrasian equilibrium. Um, and a Walrasian equilibrium is a price vector pa paired with an allocation. Okay, and a, a set of prices, one for each type of good, are Walrasian equilibrium prices uh, if there exists an allocation mu with the following properties. Okay, so first, every buyer should be assigned something in his demand set. Okay, so this is an allocation that can result when everybody sort of greedily maximizes their own self-interest by something in their demand set. Okay, that's the first condition. That's sort of the equilibrium condition on the buyer side. They should be best responding to the prices. And the second condition is that if there is some kind of good that is under-demanded, that is, if the number of copies of that good being sold are less than the supply, the only time that can happen is if the price is zero. Okay, the thought being that um, there's downward price pressure. If uh, supply is exceeding demand, you'd lower the price. If you can't lower the price, it must be zero. Okay, and so uh, the, the prices themselves are not what are called the Walrace in equilibrium, but the price is paired with a, a suitable uh, allocation. And, um, you, you know, okay, if these objects exist, you know, they've got like a pretty remarkable property, which is that 
we've got this sort of decentralized, we've got this sort of feasibility problem. We need to assign people to goods in a way that satisfies all of the supply constraints, but you know, if one of these objects exists, it seems pretty remarkable that is everyone is choosing a good that sort of uniquely maximizes, or not uniquely, that, that individually maximizes their utility function, and yet, yeah, so, th so they're, not, they're not sort of thinking of the, this global objective feasibility, and, and yet somehow when they do this, everything works out. The feasibility constraints are satisfied. Okay, so these objects, if they exist, seem pretty remarkable. Um, and there's this sort of simple fact that makes them even more remarkable. It turns out these objects, when they exist, you know, it's not only that everyone, when greedily maximizing their own utility, is satisfying feasibility constraints, but they're actually globally maximizing social welfare. They're finding the optimal allocation. Okay, so you should, you know, start becoming like increasingly suspicious that these things exist. The more properties, you know, the, I, I give you like this, but but let's just sort of prove this fact because it's it's pretty easy. Okay, so the claim is. If I've got prices and an allocation, which are a well racing equilibrium, then the social welfare, that is the sum values for the allocations people get, is maximized. And this is one of the cases where, for notational simplicity, I'm going to prove it to you just in the case where people want one good, but it generalizes. Okay? So let's say we've got, you know, let, let, let's just name the optimal allocation. Let's say mu star maximizes social welfare. And, and just apply the facts we know. Okay? So we know that for every buyer, like by definition, by the first wall racing equilibrium condition, the thing they're getting maximizes their utility. That is to say, their value for the thing they get minus the price for the thing they get is at least their value minus price for anything else. In particular, the thing they would have gotten in the optimal allocation. And we've got one of these inequalities for every buyer. You know, our hands are sort of tied. We've got N inequalities. We've got to sum them together. So of course, you know, the sum over all of the buyers of the value of the thing they get minus the price of that thing is greater than the sum over all of the buyers of the value they would have gotten in the optimal allocation minus the price of that thing. And we can rearrange this sum because since this is a feasible allocation, no good is assigned to more than one person, say, if there's only one copy of each good. And so we can rearrange this as the sum over all of the values of the you know, utility, sum over all of the values for the thing they get in allocation mu minus the sum over all of the goods of the supply of that good times the price. Because it's a feasible allocation. No more than the supply of any good is sold. And moreover, by the second wall racing equilibrium condition, if we sell fewer copies of the good than there are, the price is zero. So I can really say that the left-hand side of the equation is exactly equal to this. I can do the same thing on the right-hand side and observe the price terms are exactly the same and cancel. And so we learn that, uh, well, the welfare of our allocation has to be optimal. Okay, so, so sort of classical theory, nothing new here, but if you haven't seen it before, you know, these prices really are remarkable, right? They're like everyone is like, you know, you can sort of view this as the mathematization of sort of the you know, Adam Smith's invisible hand. Uh, everyone's like, optimizing just for themselves, but like somehow uh, we get a feasible, not only do we get a feasible allocation, we get an optimal allocation. Okay, so, you know, uh, this is all predicated on the existence of these objects. You should be suspicious at this point whether they exist. But the second remarkable uh, piece of classical theory is that these prices do exist. Okay, so let me just, um, okay. they exist whenever uh, players' valuation functions satisfy what are called the gross substitutes property. Without telling you what that is, let me just prove this for you again for the simple case of unit demand buyers when they just want one good. Okay? This is a you know, proof by algorithm. It's a, this is the ascending price auction of Kelso and Crawford. And it's the, the first thing you would try when you were, if you were like selling goods to buyers. You just run an ascending price auction. Okay? So you've, you maintain some candidate matching. Initially, nobody's matched anything. And you start off by pricing everything at zero, okay? And you just let the, let the buyers take turns. While there's an unmatched buyer, you have them point to the good that currently maximizes their utility, their value minus price, okay? So they're bidding on that good. They get tentatively matched to that good. Whoever was the high bidder before is now unmatched, and the price gets incremented by some epsilon. Okay, so just a picture of what happens. We've got these goods, we've got these buyers, the prices are all zero. 
This guy bids on his favorite good. The price is incremented. Next guy bids. He outbids the first guy. So the first guy is now unmatched. The price is incremented again. This guy bids on a new good. So now we've got you know, two edges in this matching. It continues. The first guy might be, you know, again, outbid the second guy. And the algorithm concludes when we've got a matching, when everyone's matched to some good. OK, that's the, that's the whole thing. Is it going to work? Well, you know, it turns out this is like super simple to analyze. Um, you know, this is sort of a, a really nice algorithm that computer scientists should know more about. So it's not hard to observe that this algorithm is like, it, at least it, it is an algorithm. It's going to halt and output something. Okay, it's going to halt after at most n over epsilon bids are made. And that's easy to see. Nobody's ever going to bid on something that's uh, above their value because one option is for them to sort of become unmatched. And their values are between 0 and 1, so nobody's ever going to bid on something that has a price higher than 1. Okay. So the prices are all bounded between 0 and 1. Um, say we've got n goods, that means the sum of the prices never goes above n, but every time someone bids, the sum of the prices goes up by epsilon. So we can't have more than n over epsilon bids. So this does halt and output some allocation. Um, and uh, it's also not hard to see that when this algorithm halts, the price and the allocation form an approximate wall racing equilibrium, meaning for any buyer i, their value for the thing they get minus the price of the thing they get is at least their utility for their favorite good at the final price is possibly minus epsilon. That's also easy to see. Um, you know, why, are they, why is buyer i matched to good mu i? Well, it's because he was the last person to bid on good mu i. That's how the algorithm works. And at the time that he bid on it, the reason he bid on it was because it was the, it was the good that maximized his value minus price. It, was, you know, it satisfied this inequality exactly. And since that time, the other prices have only gone up. So you know, he doesn't prefer any of the other goods any more than he did at the time he bid on this. And he's still the high bidder, so nobody else has outbid him. And so this price has gone up only by epsilon. You know, we tricked him after he bid. We raised the price by epsilon, but not more than that. Okay. Uh, so, you know, squinting a little bit now, taking epsilon to zero while racing equilibria always exist. Uh, this can be made formal. Um, and by the way, uh, this algorithm, you know, gro gross substitutes valuations are the largest class of valuation functions for which while racing equilibria exist, and um, they're basically defined as the largest class of valuations that the analysis of this algorithm works. But it turns out this algorithm is sort of fully general. Um, by the way, like, because while racing and equilibria maximize social welfare, and that's just the weight of the matching in this case, this is an algorithm for computing a max weight matching that has nicer properties than the algorithm we often teach to undergraduates. Uh, in particular, it's much easier to analyze and can be distributed. People should study this algorithm. Um, OK, so that, that's sort of the classical theory. Uh, so, so this sort of amazing fact that while racing and equilibria uh, you know, are able to optimally coordinate markets, people buy what they want, the supply constraints are satisfied, and globally welfare is optimized, is not because the statement is vacuous. It's not because while racing and equilibria don't exist. They do exist. You can even find them through natural dynamics. And so, so this is sort of you know, a, a, a remarkable achievement of theory. One other thing, it turns out that while racing and equilibrium prices are, are not unique. There's a multiplicity of them. And it turns out they form a lattice. So what that means is it makes sense to talk about the minimal while racing and equilibrium prices. These are equilibrium prices that uh, good by good are smaller than any other set of equilibrium prices. And these are the ones I want to study because these are focal in various ways. So these ascending price auction dynamics, the one I showed you and others, they converge to the minimal equilibrium prices. And they've got other you know, focal properties, like in the unit demand case, they happen to correspond to VCG prices. So when I study, when I go on and talk about wall racing equilibrium prices, I'm really talking about minimal wall racing equilibrium prices. OK, so, so at this point, it's like, tempting to summarize this classical theory in the following slogan, um, prices optimally coordinate a large class of markets. I mean, there's this natural dynamic that converges to these prices. 
Um, and these prices, you know, somehow harness people's greedy uh, optimization to, to do this global optimization. And what this talk is about is sort of, you know, thinking about whether this, uh, this interpretation is really justified, you know, like trying to poke a couple holes in it and, and then see if we can plug up those holes. Okay. So the first problem I want to like poke into here is that it's a little misleading to say that the prices are coordinating the market. Okay, remember, a well racing equilibrium was a set of prices paired with an allocation. Okay, so there was an optimal allocation such that everybody was buying some most demanded bundle, some bundle in their demand set. But they might have had many bundles in their demand set, and it's not true that for every way that you know, people can choose bundles in their demand set, the allocation is feasible and the welfare is optimal. They, they might have to actually coordinate in a very particular way. And, and sort of if coordination was the whole thing we were hoping prices were solving, then you know, it's sort of a bummer if like, even after we have these prices, we, we still need to do lots of coordination. Uh, so, so just to give you like, an example of, of how this can happen, I suppose this, in a simple market, we've got n buyers, n goods, each supply one. And buyer i has value one for good one, and value one for good i, the good directly across from him, and value zero for everyone else. OK? So and maybe there's some, some guys who aren't drawn here who have good you know, 0.5 for everything. Okay. So in this case, you know, th this is the minimal wall racing equilibrium. These are the minimal wall racing equilibrium prices. And note that the optimal allocation is supported here. What should happen is every, every person I should buy the good directly across from them. Okay. And the lines here represent uh, items in each buyer's demand set. So every buyer demands the good directly across from him and good one. Okay, but um, al although you know that allocation is supported by these prices, everyone's actually like indifferent between good i, the one they're supposed to buy, and good one. And if people break ties, say randomly, half of them will try to buy good one. Okay, so we'll have like really high over demand. There's only one copy of good one, but we'll have n over two people demanding it. And it's not just because we chose the wrong wrong tie breaking rule. It's pretty simple to generalize this. You can come up with a distribution over examples so that for every tie-breaking rule, over demand is n over 2. Okay, so, so, okay. So, so coordination can be a pretty serious problem, and prices here are doing nothing to solve the coordination problem. Um, what I didn't mention, this first guy here, he's actually an economist. He's got commoners. I'm sorry he couldn't make it to the talk, but, um, but, but a lot of this uh, work came out of a conversation I had with him a, you know, a bunch of years ago where I, I showed him like this example. I was like, you know, okay, economist, like what now? Um, and he said, no, 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 that, that example is non-generic. Okay, so uh, what does that mean? It, it, so uh, what non-generic means to an economist is, you know, look, you computer scientists, you're like obsessed with like worst case examples, worst case analysis. Sure, like, you know, you can cook up this thing where you've carefully tailored, you know, everyone to have like an exact indifference between good one and good eye, uh, in which over demand is like a huge problem, but like, you know, that wouldn't happen normally. Uh, somehow under, under some reasonable distributional assumption about where people's valuations come from, uh, over demand really shouldn't be a problem, and over demand should just go away. Okay. And, and that's, you know, a, a plausible, um, conjecture. I mean, if I, like, fixing the prices, if I, like, randomly perturb the valuations, like, there will be no indifferences. Uh, but the tricky thing is that the prices are computed as a function of the valuation. So if I perturb the valuations, the prices will also change. Um, and it's not too hard to see that, like, actually, at the minimal wall racing prices, there will always be indifferences. You can't get rid of this problem. That is, no matter what you do with the valuations, there have to be indifferences at the minimal prices. Um, and it's pretty easy to see. Supp suppose it weren't true. Suppose you had some special set of valuations for which there were no indifferences. Okay, so what that means is that for every buyer I, good J is in his demand set only if, if and only if, good J is the thing that he's supposed to get in the optimal allocation. Okay? But th in that case, we could take any non-zero, we could take any good that has a non-zero price. Okay? It is 
demanded by the guy who's supposed to get it. And crucially, it's not demanded by anyone else. So there's some positive epsilon for which we could lower that price. The guy who's supposed to get it wants the good even more now. It's yes, definitely still a most demanded good. And because nobody else demanded it before, you know, there was some strict gap between the utility anyone else had for this good and the good they were getting, I can lower the price by a little bit, and, and it's still a well in equilibrium. And this would contradict the fact that the prices were minimal. Okay. So unfortunately, we can't get rid of this problem of uh, over-demand. That is, over-demand is just always going to be a problem at the minimal prices. And um, that, that doesn't mean we can't do something about it. So we're computer scientists. We love approximation. But it, it does mean that to think about this problem, we have to think about it um, through the lens of approximation. We can't hope that generically there are no indifferences. Yeah. Like, you might have... So this is not just for the unit demand case. I mean, for any... No, but if you have what, more than one item from each good, like SJ is bigger than one, then... Mm -hmm. So uh, what this is saying is that you, you know, you always have over demand at least one for every... Okay. No matter what the supply is. Okay. So, but, you know, we might still hope to be able to specify conditions under which the over demand isn't too bad. The second, the second question I want to like raise is this question of where do prices come from? Where do these prices come from? And, and we've seen like, you know, it's not that the classical theory has nothing to say about this. Like, there's this really nice ascending price auction dynamic that converges to the prices. But yeah, you know, so we have these natural auction dynamics. But like, when I walk into Starbucks or when I go to the like farmers market in Rittenhouse Square, I do not engage in an ascending price auction. Like I, I see <laughs> the prices that like existed before I showed up. They were not a function of my valuation or bids. And I just buy stuff and like still things work out. Okay, so, so like where do the prices come from? We have a story that shows how to compute these prices interactively if you've got the buyers there in the market, but that doesn't match our experience of, of how we interact with prices. So, it's true that like, you know, when I walk into Starbucks or into a farmer's market, the prices do not change as a function of what my valuation is for the goods. I'm not participating in an auction. But you know, they, they certainly change compared to as a function of like what the demand for these goods was last month. So you might imagine that in practice, what's going on is prices are encoding distributional information. They're sort of approximate while racing equilibrium prices learned somehow um, to, to match the distribution of buyers who tend to show up in this market. But when you start modeling things like this, you've got to ask all of the questions that come up when you study a learning problem. So in particular, how much distributional information is necessary before I can find good prices? How many buyers do I need to see before I can confidently say that the prices I find will induce high welfare and low overdemand on new buyers? Uh, and it also means that we, we need a theory for approximate wall race in prices. That is, it's not enough to understand over demand for like the exact minimal wall race in prices computed like on the market you know, as a function of everyone sitting in this room. I need to think about what's going to happen if I use the prices computed for people in this room for the people who attend the next seminar, which might be a similar group of people, but not exactly the same. So I need to think about approximate equilibrium prices. So here's the model we study in this work. Okay. We've got some k types of goods, each with some supply. And we've got a distribution, an unknown distribution over valuation functions. And what happens is n buyers are sampled IID from this distribution. Okay. And then the market somehow equilibrates at the minimal equilibrium prices for these buyers. Okay, I'm, I'm agnostic as to how this happens. Maybe they run the ascending price auction dynamic uh, we saw a moment ago. But the point is, uh, the, these buyers are not the ones we're selling to. These buyers go away once these prices have been computed, and n new buyers are sampled from the same distribution. OK, now these buyers are going to look at the prices. They're going to figure out what their demand sets are, their most demanded bundles, which might not be singleton sets. They might have indifferences. And they're going to pick arbitrary bundles in their demand set. They're going to break ties in arbitrary ways. And what I want to ask is, what are conditions under which, when this is what's happening, I can be confident that the overdemand is small and that the welfare is high? 
Okay. Does the question make sense? Questions at this point before we like go into talking about the answer? Okay. Um, so, so I want to ask, how much overdemand should we expect under, under what conditions? And what do these things depend on? Does it depend on assumptions about the distribution? Does it depend on the complexity of the valuation functions, the number of buyers, the number of types of goods? These are you know, um, sample complexity questions if you're a machine learning person. OK, and, and by analogy to machine learning, there's sort of two questions we need to answer to think about this. OK, so, so in, in machine learning, you know, there's a similar setup. I've got a, a sample of data points, and I'm going to fit a model to those data points, but then I'm going to evaluate my model on new data points. And the two things I need to bound if I want to prove a theorem about the quality of my learned classifier is one, what's the training error? How good is my classifier on the actual data I've got? And two, what's the generalization error? How much, what's the gap between the quality of my classifier on my sample and on the distribution? So by analogy, the, the first question, bounding training error, corresponds to asking, under what conditions do the exact equilibrium prices computed on the market of people induce little overdemand? And remember, we saw this sort of example where the exact price is induced as high overdemand as possible. So the answer is not always. We need to have some condition here. And the second question is, um, once I you know, suppose I do have a set of prices that induces low overdemand on the sample on which they were computed, um, under what conditions will these prices generalize in that when I use them on a new sample of buyers, they will also induce low overdemand and high welfare? And how much data do I need, meaning how many buyers do I need in my market before I can be confident that this is going to happen? Okay, so, so, so let's think about the first question. And again, um, I'll, I'll tell you the extent to which this is going to be a result that holds generally. But for the purposes of the talk, I want to simplify things and, and talk about unit demand buyers. So these are buyers who only want one item. And the nice thing about buyers who only want one item is I can describe the valuation function of a buyer by just k numbers, one number that specifies for each good how much he wants that good. And so if I've got a market of n buyers, it's described by just n times k numbers. OK, so, so we know we need to assume something about the buyer valuations in order to have low over demand. We saw this bad example. And here's something that you can assume that I'm going to show is sufficient. OK, what, what I want to assume is that the buyer valuations, these n times k numbers, are linearly independent over the integers. Meaning, if I take some sum of these things with integer coefficients, the only way I can get them to sum to 0 is if all of the coefficients are 0. And in fact, I don't even need that. I don't even need them to be linearly independent over all of the integers, but just three of the integers, minus 1, 0, and 1. OK, so, so if I take some linear combination of the valuation functions and I tell you both that the coefficients are limited to be minus 1, 0, and 1, and that the sum is 0, then the only way that can happen is if all of the coefficients were 0. That's the assumption. Just like two notes about this, um, it, it, you know, it's satisfied with probability one for any reasonable perturbation of the valuation functions. So I'm sort of justified in calling this a generosity assumption, okay? Because you know, there's only uh, finitely many such sums, and it also implies that the welfare optimal allocation is unique, and that, that's actually important because. One fact about Walrasian and equilibria prices that I haven't mentioned to you yet is that they actually support, they necessarily support all welfare optimal allocations. So if the welfare optimal allocation wasn't unique, there would like, you know, if there were a bunch of them, there would definitely be a bunch of indifferences because everyone's indifferent between anything they could get in any optimal allocation. So the theorem that we can prove subject to this genericity condition is that uh, Overdemand is as is as low as possible. Okay, so if the valuation functions satisfy this genericity condition, and we've got the minimal Walrasian equilibrium prices for the actual buyers in the market, then for every good J, the number of people who have good J in their demand correspondence is at most the supply of the good plus one. Okay, in particular, that means that no matter how people break ties, the overdemand on any good is at most one. 
And remember from, the, from this simple argument, we know that it always has to be at least one for every, every profile evaluation function, so this is sort of tight. And let's just think about what this is saying for a second. This isn't so, this isn't so great if the supply of each good is just one, because then the overdemand could be like twice the supply. Um, and, and that's sort of necessary. But it's saying as, th as this really becomes a commodity market, as the supply grows large, the overdemand really becomes a diminishing fraction of the supply. It stays one while supply grows large. Okay. So that's the statement. It's actually, you know, once we've restricted it to unit demand buyers, pretty easy to prove. I can prove it to you by picture. Um, a picture of some text, but there'll be a real picture on the next slide. Um, it's all, everything's proof by picture. Um, so let's fix the optimal allocation, okay? And let's fix the minimal equilibrium prices. And let's construct a graph, okay? We're gonna have vertices and edges. And the vertices are, there's gonna be one vertex for every type of good, okay? And edges are gonna to correspond to buyers. There will be an edge between good J and good J prime. If there is a buyer who, who gets good J in the optimal allocation, but is indifferent between getting good J and good J prime. That is, there's a, an edge between J and J prime if there's some buyer who is getting good J but also has good J prime in his demand correspondence where J and J prime are distinct. There's no self loops in this graph. Okay, simple graph. Here's a picture of such a graph. We've got a, a vertex for every good. What it means that there's an edge between the pocket knife and the bottle opener is that this blue guy, uh, you know, is supposed to get the pocket knife in the optimal allocation. Must be in his demand set since these are, uh, since this is a wall racing equilibrium. But um, he, could have bought, he could have equally well been happy buying the bottle opener. That was also in his demand correspondence. Okay, that's the graph I want to think about. Um, okay, so, so, and, and I want to like analyze this claim by just making a bunch of simple observations about this graph. So the first is that the graph has got to be acyclic. Okay, so if it wasn't acyclic, the players could swap allocations around a cycle. Okay, the total demand for every good would remain the same since we just, we just had a swap around a cycle and everyone would still be buying a most demanded good because what the edges mean is exactly that the players would have been happy with that swap. But this would have been a distinct max welfare allocation. Since this would have also been a well racing equilibrium, it would have also have had to be a max welfare allocation. And our genericity assumption implies that there's a unique max welfare allocation. So this can't happen. Okay, so I drew the graph wrong, it turns out. Uh, it can't be acyclic, that edge can't have been there. Okay, so the first thing is no cycles in the graph. So if we've got a graph that's acyclic, uh, we can topologically sort the graph. We can sort the graph so that all of the edges are going forwards and we can uh, rename the vertices, renumber them in order of this topological sorting. Okay, and it's gotta be that the first vertex has in degree zero. And the first vertex has uh, no edges coming into it because edges all go forwards in this ordering. Okay, so we can reorder the graphs that all edges go forwards. The next claim is that any good that has in degree zero has got to have price zero. Okay, because otherwise we could have lowered the price. If a good has in degree zero, um, that means it's not in the demand set of anyone except for people who get that good. Okay, because otherwise there would have been an edge from someone who didn't get the good but wanted it. Um, and we could have lowered the price. We saw this argument before. That would contradict the fact that the, these prices were minimal while racing equilibrium prices. So at the minimal prices, any good that has in degree zero has to have price zero. You, you might become a little suspicious at this point because like, well, <laughs> we're not always gonna have like zero price goods in while racing equilibria. Uh, when I'm drawing the graph for simplicity, I'm, you know, uh, obfuscate, uh, I'm leaving something out there should also be a vertex that corresponds to the empty allocation. There should also be um, a vertex that corresponds to not getting anything, okay? Uh, that, uh, and that might be the one with price zero. Um, okay, so the next claim is that when I'm trying to figure out what these non-zero prices are, okay, um, any price PJ can be written as a linear combination of valuations of buyers who get goods 
earlier in the ordering, earlier than j in this topological sort. And the coefficients are going to be just minus 1, 0, and 1. OK, proof by induction. Well, the base case is, well, the, the first price is 0, so uh, we're done. And the inductive case is just as follows. Suppose I've got a non-zero price, which I do without loss of generality, because otherwise we're done for that good. Um, well, we know that it's got to have uh, in degree at least 1, OK? Because anything that didn't had price 0. So that means there is some buyer i um, who in the optimal allocation is matched to an earlier good, okay, something that came earlier in the ordering, um, but who would have been happy getting good j as well, has good j in his demand correspondence. So this buyer is indifferent between good j and good j prime. We can just write out that indifference condition. It means his value for good j minus the price, his value for good j prime minus the price of good j prime is just equal to his value for good j minus the price of good j. And solving, that means we can write the price of good j as the value of good j, that buyer i has for good j minus the value that buyer i has for good j prime plus the price of good j prime. But good j prime comes earlier in the ordering, so we can apply our inductive hypothesis to this. That's it. So, so any price can be written as a um, simple linear combination of valuations of buyers for goods that come earlier in this ordering. Um, and then the final claim, and this is the one that's going to prove the theorem, is that all of these goods have in degree at most one. Okay, and remember the over demand for a good is at most the in degree of the vertex corresponding to that good, because edges correspond to people who uh, aren't supposed to get this good but still want it. Okay, so if we can show that the in degree in this graph is at most one, we've proven the claim. Um, so, so that's not so hard. Let's suppose that weren't the case. Okay, so suppose the in degree wasn't at most one. That means there's some good that has uh, two buyers, that has two edges coming into it. Okay, so that means there's two distinct buyers, i and i prime, um, who are both indifferent between some good. Um, mu of i, which comes earlier in the ordering, and this good j, uh, and some other good uh, mu of i prime, which also comes earlier in the ordering, and this good j. Okay, So we've got these two indifference conditions, which means we've got two distinct ways of solving for the price vector. Okay, So let's, you know, we can solve for the price vector in both of those ways and subtract them. And what that means, you know, having, once we have two expressions for these price vectors, we know, you know price j is you know, one fixed quantity, if we subtract these two ways of writing price j, we have to get zero. Uh, we have that this expression equals zero. Okay. Um, this expression has some valuations in it, and it's got some prices, but we know the prices from the last claim can also be written as minus one, zero, one, linear combinations of valuations. And we know that because buyer i and buyer i prime are distinct, because there were two different edges coming into this one uh, good, that this isn't a trivial linear combination. The prices don't cancel out these two valuations. Uh, and so this is a non-trivial minus 1, 0, 1 linear combination that sums to 0, and that, that violates our generosity condition. OK, so that, that proves the claim. That's sort of the first thing. And, and um, yeah, so, so the takeaway is, you know, look, this is sort of the training error part of the talk. If we use the exact minimal wall race in equilibrium prices, um, even assuming worst case tie breaking, um, the over demand can be at most one. I showed this to you for unit demand valuations. What you'd really like to do is prove this uh, under a, you know, some generalization of the condition for gross substitutes valuations. Yeah. Part so you can take the body of your sandwich. But, uh, <laughs> could you say how this relates to the example you gave before where the over demand was much greater than one? So, what's different about that example than the assumptions you So, there are buyers were indifferent between, good one, between two goods, good one and good i. That violates the generosity condition because the difference between those two valuations is zero. So, we know, you, we know from that example that you need some condition in order to bound the over demand. 
this is a condition that in particular rules out that example, as it must, since we can prove this theorem. Generosity says that you, things are kind of, the, pre, the valuations are kind of up to, like small changes won't affect things, and that was a case where small changes had a big effect on the. It means you can't, in particular, it means you cannot have exactly the same value for any two goods. Which is what rules out the previous yeah. example. Does that make sense? Other questions? So how do you map generosity to real life, a real life assumption? Because it's, uh, it, it looks like a very strong assumption on, on preferences. Um, yeah, so maybe on the one hand, I mean, so you could also say it as if it doesn't look like a strong assumption. I mean, if I take any probability distribution with, you know, like a continuous support um, and sample evaluations yeah, from it, it'll be that. satisfied with probability one. The other thing is, you, in order to analyze anything, in order to get results of this form, you sort of need a condition like this because we've seen that without such a condition, um, the overdemand can be terrible. Now, you're right, like, it is not clear whether it makes sense to say that in a real market this condition is satisfied or not. I'm not even sure people would be able to, you know, uh, describe their valuation functions in terms of numbers if you press them on it. So whether this is a good assumption or not is a good exactly. question. So I'm asking in terms of your model trying, is trying to explain what happens in real markets. Mm -hmm. and Probably, uh, so there are two, I think, two big differences. One is that people don't have exact uh, to the I don't know, a million uh, decimal point, uh, digit uh, up to the decimal point uh, evaluations. They, the By the way, like perturbations that would get this generosity condition don't necessarily need a million I agree, decimal but points, they need about log n decimal points. Yeah, but even that is quite a lot uh, when it could be yeah. large. Yeah. And, and, and and secondly, uh, so people probably discretize their, their, their evaluations. They don't work over great numbers. And also they have uh, preferences are not strict. They, they have some you know, like gray areas where they wouldn't be, would remain indifferent even if you know you would do the math with their numbers and, and, and there is a one cent. Uh, You're right. So, you know. So it's not even clear that people can be modeled as, you know, <coughs> utility maximizers for some fixed utility function. And w what we're doing doesn't address that question at all. Um, you know, hopefully we're taking some step trying to get the classical theory, which still makes all of these assumptions a little bit closer to practice. But like, it, it's still theory, and it, it still has lots of things that might not fit how people behave in the real world. But that's a great question. Um, yeah. Uh, so, like, there's. I think, by the way, there's like a second part of the talk. So, in case people thought this was the question section, but you still go on. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question anyway. Okay, good. So, <laughs> I, I, just, I thought there might be some confusion by being on this slide. But, uh, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, okay. So, so like, your sort of motivating example is this case where. Everyone is indifferent, and if everyone just like points to the good they want, mm -hmm. and like will settle for like they've broken ties arbitrarily, but will like never change their mind, then we get this like massive over demand, right? Like there's n different like you know equivalent like coffee shops, but like we randomly pick like the only one that will ever be good enough for us again, and then we just like all flood into that one. <laughs> so like in practice, I mean, if I were to see that like. For some reason, everyone is going to Starbucks and no one is going to Pete's. I might say, like, fine, whatever. Like, Starbucks is out of coffee. I'll go to Pete's. Right. Mm -hmm. So, that seems like another approach you could take to try to study this phenomenon. I'm curious. Right. If you you could also study the sequential question. Sequential arrival is the way you most naturally sure. uh, think about this. That's also sort of not addressed by the classical theory or by our work, and it's an interesting right, question. So like, I agree that in your example, like, there would still be that one person who only likes Starbucks, who is very unlikely to come you know, to get Starbucks. But like, you could sort of make the same, you could potentially like, prove essentially the same theorem, like that in a sequential setting, even without generosity, like, only one person is unhappy. or like, You unhappy could imagine possibly something like that. Um, I mean, it, it wouldn't. 
Um, you can imagine something like that. I'm not sure if your conjecture is yeah. true, but yeah, quite the way um, yeah. So that's an interesting question. It's a different question. One thing it would have is sort of if you think about the you know time frame under which such dynamics would have to play out, it would sort of be you know like at least linear and and that is I'd like show up at Starbucks and like oh man they're out of coffee like so you know now I like try the next one but like they're out of coffee too it might take a while um, so, so there is some there is some um, something nice about having the prices coordinate everyone in a decentralized way because then I, I don't have to like you know iterate through my choices until I find the best one that's not been exhausted but it's a it's except a, for this iterative process of like finding the right process right prices right. Um, well, once we, who knows how you find the prices? But once you've got the prices, it coordinates people. So, so I, I'm not. That's a, that's an interesting question. We can talk about it <laughs> for the rest of the week. Um, <laughs> but uh, careful language. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a different question. Good one. Though. Other other good questions. Okay. So I, I've got a few minutes left. So let me just sort of sketch our answer to the the second part of this question, which is, again, by analogy, if the first part of the talk was talking about the training error, the second part is talking about the generalization error. Um, we now know a condition under which when we compute exactly the equilibrium prices for some population, it'll, they'll induce low over demand. But you know, as John says, like that required an iterative process. Um, suppose now that we've got these prices, we don't want to like run auctions anymore. We just want to use these prices. Um, and we're going to use them on people we haven't seen before, but who are drawn from the same population. How, under what conditions can we say that they'll work almost as well, that overdemand will be small, and that welfare will be large? OK, proof by picture. Um, so uh, I just want to set up some notation for what, what are the kinds of things we need to think about. Um, so first of all, n now we sort of need to fix a tie-breaking rule. It, it can be arbitrary, but I, but I want to like think about people, every person having dear in their heart some tie-breaking rule they're going to use, because one trivial way any learning algorithm could be screwed up is if everyone uses one tie-breaking rule on the sample and a totally different tie-breaking rule on the, uh, in the next sample. OK, so, so I want to think about, for every evaluation, fixing some tie-breaking rule. Don't care what it is, but fix it, which is going to be a rule that tells them Given what their demand set is, which bundle are they going to buy at a fixed price vector? OK. And I just want to have an excess of notation and rename this thing f. Um, this is just the function that, parameterized by the price vector, tells me, given someone's valuation function, what bundle they're going to buy. OK. It's a function that maps valuation functions to the bundle they're going to buy. And for every good, I want to define this sort of lower dimensional function, which tells me, one for each good j, which tells me, given your valuation function, are you going to buy good j or not? Is good j an element of the bundle you're going to buy or not? OK. And then with this sort of uh, excess notation, we can talk about what is the expected demand for a good, given a distribution and a price vector. OK, given a distribution d over valuation functions, the expected demand for a good j is just n, the number of buyers in the sample, times the expected value of this indicator function, which tells me, are you going to buy, is a random person going to buy a good j or not? And just the expected number of people who are going to buy a good. And it suffices for our purposes to obtain uniform convergence of the empirical averages to their expectations for this set of functions, one for every good j and for every price vector p. These functions which tell me what is the expected um, demand for a good given the distribution. If, if I can get enough samples so that, these ex so that for every function in this class, the empirical averages, that is the empirical demand, converges uniformly to their expectations, then in particular I know that with high probability, if I have two distinct markets, two distinct sets of n buyers, since both of them have demand close to their expected demand, they're also close to one another. In particular, if I had my genericity condition satisfied and I found a price vector that induced over demand that was low, at most one on the first sample, 
I would know that over demand would have to be small on the second sample as well. So that's sort of the name of the game to prove a uniform convergence bound over this class of functions. Okay, and I'm going to skip over a lot of this, but let me just give you the outline. This is some sort of basic learning theory. So it turns out that um, for the kinds of classification problems you're used to thinking about, one dimensional Boolean learning problems, so like labeling emails spam or not, it turns out that the, the sample complexity, the number of samples I need to learn a class of functions, to learn a, a good rule for predicting um, you know, the labels of new samples drawn from the same distribution, is the same as the number of samples I need to get uniform convergence over all of the functions in the class of their you know, empirical means to their expectations. But for multi-dimensional or real valued learning problems, once I move beyond classification, this is no longer the case. The sample complexity for learning can be smaller than the sample complexity needed for uniform convergence. So this is going to be sort of the outline of the argument. We're going to consider these functions f, which map people's values to bundles. These are going to be the functions that predict, given a valuation function, what bundle are you going to buy? We're going to show that this class of functions is learnable with a number of samples that scales only with k over epsilon, the number of types of goods in the market divided by the error parameter you want when you're learning it. Now this is a, not a Boolean learning problem. The labels here are, are bundles. And so uniform, is, learnability does not imply uniform convergence for this class of functions. However, if I can learn this class of functions, that means I can also learn the class of functions which uh, just tell me, given evaluation function, are they going to buy like good J or not? Are they going to buy good one or not? Because if I can accurately predict the whole bundle they're going to buy, of course I can predict whether they're going to buy like good one. So therefore, this class of functions is also learnable with the same number of samples. And this is a Boolean class of functions. And so by sort of classical results in learning theory, this is also enough samples to get, uh, sorry, th this also gives me the fact that k over epsilon samples are enough to get uniform convergence up to error epsilon for every function in the class. Uh, so there's some stuff that goes into proving that. Um, but the punchline is this. The total demand for any good, okay, okay. if my distribution is such that, the, that, that a sample of buyers from this distribution will with high probability satisfy my generosity condition, then, if I can also say that the supply of every good is reasonably but not enormously large, that is linearly, you know, it should scale linearly in the number of types of goods but can be independent of the number of buyers in the market, okay? then I can be confident that if I computed the minimal Walrasian prices on my first sample, that on the second sample the demand for any good is within a one plus or minus epsilon factor of the supply. So over demand is relatively mild. Okay, that's over demand. Um, we need to think about welfare too. And for welfare, we can't do this nice trick of projecting down onto a Boolean class of functions because welfare is like inherently a real valued thing. Even the single buyer problem is mapping a valuation function to like a real number. And so we've got a more directly bound some combinatorial notion of dimension relevant to learning, the pseudo dimension. You can do that with a picture. Um, but the punchline is a similar but slightly worse bound. If we want um, the welfare to be within a one minus epsilon factor of opt, uh, we need opt to be sufficiently large and it should be now quadratically large in the number of types of goods. So in particular since the buyers now have values between zero and one, there've gotta be at least k squared buyers. Um, okay, oh, and, and these results, by the way, the sample complexity results, the, the nice thing about them is they are completely independent of the complexity of the valuation functions. That is, I have not assumed anything about the valuation functions to prove these results, not even that they're gross substitutes. So these valuation functions can really be arbitrarily complicated functions mapping bundles to um, to real numbers, and the sample complexity results of how many samples I need to uh, learn good prices for these 
functions do not depend on the complexity of the functions. They're only linear in the uh, number of types of goods. Okay, so, uh, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Jonathan. coffee shops and pizza shops, then there are probably a lot of consumers relative to the number of goods. But if you mm -hmm. think of sort of, you know, the coffee shop in Harvard Square and then, you know, the, the, the next one, you know, Central Square is different goods or whatever, you know, there, there's many different varieties of, of a given, you know, large class of goods, then you might actually think that the, the yeah. consumers is not that large relative to the number of differentiated. So, so there's definitely different kinds of markets, but I, I think like it should be sort of a common case when the number of types of goods is relatively small compared to the number of consumers. This would be sort of the number of distinct items sold at a grocery store compared to the number of people who walk into the grocery store over the shelf life of those items or something. So I mean, the, certainly for like the unit demand case, um, if I mean the, the total number of goods is the number of types of goods times the supply of each good. And um, you know, unless that's comparable, unless that's, you know, like, um, smaller than n, the prices are sort of going to be zero. Um, so that's certainly true in the unit demand case if you're going to you know, view the wall rate standing equilibrium prices as being at all reasonable. Um, it, it's certainly the case that it's not always satisfied. Um, you know, the supply, in particular, like um, even if the number of types of goods is relatively small, like in an art auction, if the supply of each good is also small, only one, then these results really aren't, aren't telling you any good news. In fact, you know, it's sort of telling you bad news for this theory. That is, no matter what you do at the minimal equilibrium prices, you will always have over demand that's, you know, a factor of two larger than your supply. But um, sort of saying that in the case when you've got a commodity market, meaning there's a bunch of copies of each good and uh, the number of types of goods is smaller than the number of buyers, then things should work out, at least up to this approximation factor. Ben? Uh, I'm wondering if there's some version of Scott's objection might actually still be sensible. Okay. Uh, I don't have an answer to this. Uh, under your generosity assumption on preferences, are there a continuum of wall rate in equilibria? Um, not always. So you could, ask a, you could ask a different question than the one we posed. Okay, so, so we decided to study the problem from the following perspective. Um, we decided to fix a particular wall rate and equilibrium price factor, the minimal ones, because we decided you know, those are focal for various reasons, and study what happens there. You could have asked the, instead sort of uh, the following question. Suppose what I've got is sort of a fully informed like principal who's going to look at all of the people in the room he's going to sell to, he knows all of their valuations, and he's now going to try to compute as a function of all of the people some price factor that's going to induce no indifferences. Okay, that'll have a different answer. The answer to that question is he can do so if and only if the max welfare allocation is unique, up to at least if people have gross substitutes valuations. But I, I sort of view, the reason I think that question is less interesting is because I sort of view um, market equilibrium prices as something that's supposed to happen in a decentralized way, not the result of an informed principle solving a linear program. Um, but, but that question has a different answer. I don't know if that answers your objection. I think, I think that there aren't a continuum of, there aren't always a continuum of all rating equilibrium answers to my question. I worry that if you pick a random one, then with high probability there are no discordations or something like that. Um, yeah, so I don't know exactly. Uh, yeah, picking a random one, you know, where the, the, the set of all rates and equilibria is always a convex set, so you know, right? You, you could imagine sampling a random one in the polytope, and um, it might or might not have nice properties. But that seems like a less but like so. The algorithms we know that converge to these things don't converge to random all rates and equilibria. Right? But as you point out, though, we don't we don't use an algorithm to converge to. You, you're right. So, that, so so that's true. Uh, a random one might have different properties. How does your generosity assumption um, restrict the collection of more equilibrium? It doesn't explicitly 
restricted. Or indirectly through the worker um, Yeah, I mean, so one thing it implies is that the there's only one optimal allocation, um, which is, you know, uh, sort of necessary if you want to limit differences because any equilibrium price always supports all optimal allocations. Um, but I don't know of a clean description of like what it does to the set of prices. I just have a clarification question because so it seems to take a learning perspective thinking about that. Oh, so you got the distribution, well you got a sample of buyers and you calculate the, the equilibrium and then thinking about kind of an analogy of the generalization error for that equilibrium crisis, let's say that's already now. Um, so um, what about the coordination problem of calculating that initial equilibrium? Was that because that you don't consider that because the generosity condition that you know that down to just a single um, well, optimization? Yeah, so it's a, this issue of like how, how the market equilibrates to the right. equilibrium prices on the sample, that's sort of something that's just outside of our model. We don't consider you that. Just we just assume that it happens. So. And we know of, the existing theory tells us, you know, that at least algorithmically it's possible and, and sort of implicit in it <coughs> that it happens in markets. Uh, and we do not provide any additional explanation for how it happens. We just ask, you know, if it happens, but then the buyers are resampled. Okay. How does that so break? So it's not things? like that the generosity condition actually... So it does not make the computational problem easier in any sense, as far as I know. Okay. Yeah. So you've given like these sufficient conditions for uh, the results that you have. Do, do you think those are like tight? I mean, it seems... Yeah, it's a good question. So um, it is important that the max welfare allocation is unique. Um, but whether... So it mostly mean like the, you know, the number of uh, the supply being the least order of K of epsilon. Oh, the, 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 learning results like are, the, the learning results are tight, yes. So you know, technically what we're doing is we're bounding the pseudo dimension for these classes of functions which exactly characterize uniform convergence and our bounds for the pseudo dimension for over demand are tight. For welfare there's a like, gap. Yeah. Uh, I'm some wondering like, you know, could one replace this with a different assumption? And is large. Um, well, n is large would not itself be good enough because we saw this sort of example um, that causes very high over demand for the pocket knife. Yeah, I'm so you're talking about n being large and some sort of generic that's assumption on the... Oh, yes. Yeah. So the, the most natural um, way to write the over demand bound, uh, like when, when you prove something in terms of, you, know, you bound a pseudo dimension for some class of functions, the most natural statement you get out of that is you get. Um, uniform convergence if the number of samples n is sufficiently large. Mm -hmm. And I sort of rewrote them in this other way because I thought it was a more natural way to think about a market. But yeah, the, the, in fact, the most immediate thing you get is something that says things are okay if n is large enough. And n depends on things like the number of copies of each good and the number of goods. More questions? Thank you, everyone.